The second uh, point that Moore brings up is what's known as definitional reframing. Um, and in definitional reframing, um, what you do in definitional reframing is you change how the problem is conceptualized by uh, either of the parties. And specifically, um, what, what Moore says is that the reframe, uh, which is also a joint problem solving statement, redefines the problem, right? So what we do is, and I'll give you an example, um, in definitional reframing, Mary and Bob have a dispute on what it is to be a spouse. Mary says a spouse is X. Bob says a spouse is Y. Remember what we said before, this is the, this is the overarching form for 99% uh, of your mediations are going to be this. Mary says spouse is defined as such. Bob says spouse is defined as such. There's a conflict, right? These, become, these concepts become mutually exclusive, right? They're not saying it's both this and this. They're saying that it's this or this. And what we want to do is we want to allow, we being mediators, want to allow the parties to arrive at some type of consensus among themselves. What definitional reframing allows um, the mediator to do, and also safeguards the self-interest of each party, is that it allows us to reframe how we conceptualize different concepts. In this example, the concept of what it is to be a spouse. Well, um, Mary, I understand um, that you think a spouse is identified as X, and Bob, I, I see that you identify that a spouse is identified as Y. Have you ever given the thought that it might be a bit of both, right? Um, what would that look like? How could you incorporate what Mary said into your concept and give the party the ability to build that bridge? Remember, as mediators, we're not building the bridge for our parties. We're allowing parties to come up um, to these conclusions independent to any sort of uh, um, any su su suggestions because in effect um, the practice of mediation isn't um, isn't covered by an ability to give advice especially legal advice right we want to always um, preserve the party self-determination so that's uh, an important aspect in definitional reframing in the third example uh, we, uh, Moore talks about uh, what's known as, and I think this is pretty interesting, metaphoric, metaphoric reframing. Um, metaphoric reframing is, 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 is very important. Um, for example, you might have someone say, um, she's, she's just as lazy as a sloth. I mean, she, she, she doesn't do anything. She, she's always, she's, she's, she's lethargic, she's not doing this and that. And what I've done is I've compared this person to a sloth, right? I'm using the metaphor of being slothful-like to identify the characteristics of some other person. You definitely want to reframe that metaphor. Another example um, might be, the, exa the classic example that's given is um, a person using a metaphor to suggest that they might be better than another person. You know, I'm like the little engine that could. I, I just keep chugging away, and I'm chugging away, and there's this huge mountain up ahead of me, and I, you know, despite whatever might happen, I'm still going to get to that goal. There's tons of ways to um, uh, that parties incorporate metaphors into their into their narrative. If the metaphor being incorporated by a party is used at the expense of another party. So there's nothing wrong with having metaphors in your mediation. Um, personally speaking, and this is completely separate from this, I think that parties should be encouraged to use metaphor in mediation. However, what Moore is saying, uh, and I think it's important to understand this, is that when metaphors are being used at the expense of the other party, that needs to be reframed. So it's not that you can't use metaphor in your mediations, or that your parties can't use metaphors in their mediations. You can't. You should. Um, however, me metaphor shouldn't be used by any party at the expense of another party. Oh, she's she's just uh, she's she's as lazy as a sloth, or he's as cold as ice. Right? He's as cold as ice would be uh, a, a metaphor that this person is using, uh, and it's being used at the expense of another party. What I would do is say, um, Are you saying that you know he's he's very unaffectionate? He's not caring. He's not giving. That's what I'm saying. What I've done is successfully. Uh, reframe that metaphor 
and I've given an alternative metaphor, rather than saying he's as cold as ice, we are addressing what the problem is. What is the problem? He's not giving, he's not loving, he's not talkative. Now that we understand what it is, instead of talking in metaphor, we can address how he could be better at talking and, or whatever the situation might be. So uh, I think um, uh, Moore's suggestion for the three types is very uh, important. Uh, only one last thing that I want to get into in the chapter pertains to sort of the agenda, how to construct agendas, what an agenda should do in the process of mediation. Um, he goes through and he talks about, a lot about agendas, and I'm not going to spend too much time uh, in discussing agendas. For those of you who are in class, you should read that section on agendas. For those of you who are just interested, you should go get uh, Christopher Moore's book and read um, the section on setting agendas. Um, there are different ways for determining what agenda will work for parties. We um, Moore talks about the simple agenda, and the simple agenda unfolds sort of as each um, in, uh, each topic of importance is addressed and clarified, then we move on. He talks about an ad hoc form of agenda. Obviously, you know by the name what an ad hoc form of agenda. Alternate uh, alteration of issues, which is important, um, that more suggesting that alternate topics be um, discussed or chosen if those topics will help in the mediation process, right? Because the point of the mediation process, in it, uh, you know, in its purest sense, is that the mediator doesn't necessarily have a formalized sequence of events. We know that there's going to be storytelling. We know that there's going to be um, uh, counter storytelling. We understand that there's going to be reframing, solution building, and all that. But the level at which it unfolds primarily depends on the party's willingness to participate. So for me, the most important thing to learn um, from Moore's discussion on agenda setting is that the agenda, uh, as far as I'm concerned, should always be flexible enough to um, encourage um, parties to exercise their self-determination, one, and two, in creating your agenda, parties should always feel that the agenda does both parties good, right? That it doesn't bias one party over another. So for example, and I'll end on this note, if within my agenda I've scheduled time for um, caucusing and I take one party out uh, I ask one party to leave the mediation and I spend three minutes with that party in caucus, I should make sure that I spend an equal amount of time uh, in caucusing with the other party, right? So within my agenda, what I would do is keep note of how much time I spend in caucus. I spent five minutes with Bob in caucus, therefore when I take, uh, ask Bob out and invite Mary in, I should spend five minutes with Mary. Because things like this will be taken for granted, but parties are keeping note of this. Mary's out of the room for 10 minutes, Bob's in the room for two minutes, Bob's gonna feel what, what's going on, right? He was discussing this with her for 10, only two with me, he's favoring her. So at all times, mediators should be uh, aware of that. Um, that concludes my discussion on chapter nine of uh, Christopher Moore's book, The Mediation Process. I hope that it was, in, um, it was informative, and I appreciate you for taking the time to watch. Thank you, goodbye.